So what do we got? We got a couple of nice straight eights, bored them out. We built the carburetor. criminal, it was them. In terms of technology, there was no catching them. Their use of technology made them almost invincible. This is Lowell Thomas. After raiding the American Trust Bank, public enemy number one, John Dillinger, roams the wilds, pursued by the hounds of justice. When you think about that era, we look at it in the context of all of the technology and the capabilities that law enforcement have now. We have so little understanding in America today of how recent law enforcement in America became professional. So law enforcement is local. There was no coordination, none, zero. Gary, Indiana didn't coordinate with Chicago. So they don't know what's going on in the next county unless it's anecdotally in a bar or in a cafe. Cops didn't have radios in their cars, you know, they couldn't communicate. It wasn't far from the Keystone Cops in a way. You go left, they go right, uh, you know, it was that whole sort of scene where the cops were literally left in the dust. Now, if you're a uniformed cop in some small town getting a bad salary and you have a bad car that's 10 years old and you can't go very fast and you pull the arm, you don't even want to confront these guys. And with the money from the robberies, Dillinger's gang was able to arm up a lot better than law enforcement because they could afford it. The uh, Thompson submachine gun wasn't cheap. Dillinger had an unlimited arsenal. For the most part, I was carrying a 1921 Thompson submachine gun and a couple of 45s. And cut. The Thompson submachine gun. It's a heavy weapon. It weighs about 10 pounds empty. This is the way the weapon would look with a 50-round drum attached. The drums obviously have a lot of firepower. We did have uh, quite a bit of training in regard to the shooting of the Thompsons, especially. A lot of people make a mistake, and they think that the Thompson is simply just fired straight from the hip, which is not the case at all. It is a rifle, and you do sight it. It's not just a kind of, you know, it's that. Johnny got fascinated with the brilliant engineering of the Thompson submachine gun, and he could break it down, field strip it. And uh, there's a scene in the film where she does that. They were armed to the teeth with the best stuff money could buy, which was probably the Thompson submachine gun, the Browning automatic rifle. It's a very heavy 20-round automatic rifle. Each character has their own gun, you know, so it kind of represents who they are. I unfortunately hit the biggest gun, the VAR, which weighs about 75 pounds, so it's a little hard to do some of the scenes. It shoots a 30-06 cartridge, and it's a very heavy weapon. When it's loaded, it weighs a little over 20 pounds. Large round, a huge velocity, a lot of penetrating power, a fearsome, fearsome weapon, and off they went. They had the Ford V8, which the cops didn't have. The famous car of the of the 1933-34 era is the Ford V8. It was one of the fastest cars of its time. It's a perfect getaway car, and Dillinger used it to its fullest extent. This is a bank robber's dream. Four doors, very big uh, running boards. The running board was a huge deal because not only could John Dillinger or Van Meter get on here and put their gun up on the top and fire back at the good guys, but they would line hostages up along the side of the car. Police officers would not start shooting at innocent bystanders. They would drop the hostages off outside of town and take off running. Dillinger may have written a letter to uh, Henry Ford telling him he made the best goddamn getaway car in America. Bank robbers in Indiana go across the border into Illinois and they're home free because there is no law against interstate crime and there's no federal police force at all. The FBI was this obscure little arm of the Justice Department. 
a lot of senators' sons, politicians' sons, a nest of nepotism, and a few scandals that led to the introduction and elevation of a young fellow no one had ever heard of named John Edgar Hoover. There is nothing mysterious about the manner in which the Federal Bureau of Investigation works. A special agent must be a good marksman and have the courage to shoot it out with the most venomous of public enemies. He must know how to take fingerprints and what to do with them afterwards. He must know that no clue, no matter how seemingly unimportant, can be overlooked. And he must realize that no case ever ends until it is solved and closed with the conviction of the guilty or the acquittal of the innocent. I have a very negative view of Hoover politically because of his megalomania, his abuse of power. But to be historically accurate and to be historically fair, he truly was a visionary. And his organization of a modern federal police force was quite impressive. When Hoover's building the first national police force, the first interstate crime bill, and using very progressive modern technology and data management and wiretaps and sending agents all across the country to find out what retail stores sold a specific coat because they know that there may have been a hideout nearby. So they're doing what is routine in law enforcement, but what had never been done before in this country. People who were brought in initially had to fit a certain type that Hoover had in mind. The agents had been recruited from the ranks of lawyers and accountants because of Hoover's idea that they should be gentlemen. When push came to shove and there was a firefight, these weren't necessarily the men who were the best able to uh, handle that. They weren't hard men. And they were up against professional armed robbers that were beyond the skill sets of these agents. So the FBI equipped up, finally. And most significantly, they imported some real tough lawmen from the Southwest, real gunfighters who had a lot of trigger time. There is a sequence written into uh, Little Bohemia, which is Winstead uploading a 10-gauge shotgun and going into a body roll, all at the same time coming up firing. It's really a devil to do. It's a tough gun to load. And it's a tough gun to load quickly, and it's a tough gun to load on the run. I worked with Taryn a lot, and you figure just by proximity to a guy who's as expert a shot, as knowledgeable about firearms as Taryn Butler is, if I keep watching him like a hawk, well, some of that's gonna rub off. Head on there. Perfect. Good again. It gives me the confidence to play a man who is just as adept with firearms as one can possibly be. This is a very uh, uh, unique, uh, 10 gauge lever action shotgun. It's really beautiful to look at and it sounds just splendid and it's absolutely perfect for the character of Charles Winstead. It was Winstead who fired 345 bullets into Dillinger's head on, I think, July 22nd. This was acknowledged in a letter from J. Edgar Hoover to Winstead in which he praise not only his fearlessness, but his deliberateness and his calm. After this gigantic manhunt, Purvis doesn't shoot Dillinger. He gets encumbered by some people, and he doesn't have that ruthlessness to do whatever he had to do to get there. The single-mindedness of a real gunfighter like Winstead, outside the biograph, 